Welcome to the Scaling Japan Podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from one hundred thousand dollars and beyond. And beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan Podcast. I am your host Tyson Batino, and I would like to thank Hashi Media for sponsoring this episode on B two C Market Entry. Leo, Dustin, and Steven, and the team at Hashi Media have helped major brands like Asus, Subway, and Alibaba. But they also support small to medium-sized businesses with their social media and influencer marketing needs in Japan. Support the podcast, but more importantly, yourself by checking them out at hashimedia.com. H A S H I media.com. And they can help you with both your domestic and also marketing overseas. I would like to welcome today's guest, Benjamin Boas. He is an author, speaker, consultant, and producer. And you have probably come across his work on NHK World, TV, Yomiuri Shimbun, Japan Times, and more. Widely recognized as the go-to expert on niche Japanese cultural topics. He helps corporations and governments on a variety of topics ranging from international messaging, cross-cultural understanding, and tourism. Benjamin is an official advisor to the Japanese government's cabinet office, which named him a Cool Japan ambassador in 2016 and a Cool Japan producer in 2022. His most recent book, From Cool Japan to Your Japan, he lays out the need for Japanese institutions to learn how they are perceived by their global audience. So I'm very glad to have Benjamin on the podcast today, and we're going to dive deeply to help everyone here understand how to take a Japanese product or service and launch it in a foreign country. We've been focusing a lot on market entry, and we're going to turn it around and talk to an expert on how we can go the other way. Benjamin was introduced by our mutual friend Stefan Fouché, and who's such a great dude, really deeply connected, one of the most connected people I know. And so I want to give you a shout out and a thank you for introducing me to Benjamin and many other people. Tyson, thanks so much for welcoming me to your podcast. It's wonderful to be here. It's also always wonderful to hear nice things said about my good friend Stefan, who is a genius who should move back to Japan very soon. And I definitely will get him on to talk about networking because that guy is just so genuine. Everyone loves him. Stefan is is really the best. So Benjamin Boaz is also a very nice man, or so I have heard. And I'm from the New York area where I grew up without any Japanese friends and certainly no Japanese family members. But I did play a lot of video games when I was little, and I kind of played all of the ones that I could back in the early '90s. I soon found out that in order to play more video games, I would have to play them in Japanese. So I petitioned my own high school principal for Japanese language classes, convinced the school to give me more homework so that I could play more video games, and kind of went from there. I went to one college, found that I couldn't learn Japanese well enough there, transferred to Brown University, spent every single one of my summer studying Japanese, got a Fulbright fellowship to come over to Japan after I graduated to get. More into Japanese culture, and found myself constantly surprised by the Japanese people who themselves were surprised that I loved Japan so much. I would meet all of these Japanese people who were like, "Well, why would you want to study on our tiny little island? You couldn't possibly like Japanese culture that much." Delving into that surprise, I've been able to build a whole career out of it because I find myself in these niche cultural issues. Uh, become something of an expert on them, and then figure out how to take them to the global world, where there are always fans waiting. The world loves Japan. I love Japan, and I'm here to stay. Man, getting that done in high school, like I think that would be like the ultimate resume and application to go to university. Everyone always has the cookie cutter things, but it's like, no, I got a new program instituted in my high school. That's very baller. Thank you. I mean, at the time, I'm not even sure if I admitted to people that that was the real reason why I wanted to learn Japanese. But now that I do it as an adult, I get positive reactions. So you know, it's cool talking about your interests. I think. 
That's really cool, man. So yeah, today we'll really dive deep into uh, kind of like, you know, taking Japanese products overseas. And I think we can start off talking a little bit about Cool Japan, but what is Cool Japan and how do you help the Japanese government with that program? It's a bit of a mouthful, Cool Japan, because it's a brand name that describes many different programs within the Japanese government. The, the Japanese government takes a multi-institutional approach towards promoting itself, its products, it cult, its culture abroad. Many of those programs are called Cool Japan. They're run by many different ministries and organizations within the government. My particular focus is on the cabinet office, which ostensibly coordinates everything. So I kind of help with the overall picture uh, how they portray themselves, how the world is led to understand what Cool Japan is. I'm not too familiar with it, but one of my buddies, a Japanese dude, uh, he created something called Dendama, mm -hmm. which was an electronic kendama. <laughs> That's where, awesome. Uh, it's a really cool device. Let's say you can play kendama, you can do tricks, and you can play against people all over the world. He was officially selected by Cool Japan. I think they sent him to the U.S. on multiple occasions because actually the Kendama capital is actually probably the U.S., not Japan. All the best Kendama players in the world are American or a lot of them are American. And he also received, I think, significant investment. I'm not sure if that was from venture capital or the government, but I think the government did put in some money to support his startup, which served as an ambassador for Cool Japan. That's amazing. That is exactly the sort of story which I try to promote internally. I mean, in as much as Cool Japan is about promoting Japan to the world, the thing is, is Japan itself doesn't really need all that much help. Uh, the world loves Japan. People think that Japan is cool. Like, it's not really a question. People tend to just assume that Japan is cool. They don't even think about it. But Japanese people and Japanese institutions, particularly the government, aren't always fully aware of just how intense its fans abroad can be. So having like, you know, the, the champion of the international kendama community in America being supported by the Japanese government, I'm going to remember that. That's a great story. Thank you. And yes, I guess talking about products from Japan to overseas, I think a lot of people know the company Boksu. What are some other products from Japan that are popular overseas that maybe people might not know about? Or maybe people who are living in Japan, but maybe they don't know that it's actually uh, kind of popular overseas. That's a great question. There's many products from Japan that are popular overseas, but of course there are many things in Japan that don't necessarily make it over the global cultural barrier. So you, you've got famous successes anime and games, just by saying those two things, everyone thinks of Japan. Entertainment and tourism are things, uh, again, that when you put Japan on them, they generally have ubiquitous appeal in the United States and in the West. High quality crafts are incredibly popular overseas. The Japanese brand is pretty much unmatched when it comes to um, handmade crafts. Then you have funny things that when you think about them, they're like, oh yeah, that's the best stuff from Japan. Washlet toilets, definitely a Japanese success. So the Japanese brand is phenomenally strong, but it also tends to be extremely targeted. It's the high-end stuff that tends to be popular abroad. So going back to like uh, anime and video games, the reason why those were such a hit in the United States is because they were able to penetrate the media market at a time when American consumers were demanding high quality products. This is little remembered now, but in the early 1980s, before Nintendo was successful, video game quality in America was so low that the E.T. video game had to be buried in the Las Vegas desert. No one would buy the E.T. Atari video game. It was called the video game crash of, I think, 1983. And it kind of heralded this moment when American consumers demanded something high quality. And that's when Nintendo managed to go in. The stuff that goes abroad tends to be kind of like the cream of the crop. That makes perfect sense. And for those who are interested in more learning about the ET, you could just search it up on YouTube. <laughs> there are tons of 20, 30 minute documentaries 
on that disaster. But I didn't know it tied in with kind of the Nintendo launch and the Nintendo boom. I guess you could say, according to me, it does. I'm not sure I've seen this argument made explicitly in many places, but well, I just think it lines up perfectly. You could say the same thing uh, about anime. High quality anime for adults is what really made huge headways into Western media markets around the turn of the millennium. And that has to do with the American comic market censoring itself during the Cold War. American comic publishers took it upon themselves to create this thing called a Comics Code Authority, this kind of form of self-censorship where publishers would not publish anything that was politically risque. So they kind of reined in their author's creativity, which meant that for a number of decades, Americans who were into comics or you know adult cartoons didn't really get all that much breadth. So when VHS tapes, DVDs, and really the internet allowed them access to all of these Japanese animated media products, it was phenomenally amazing to them because it was like creativity like they had never seen. So in in an ironic way, the Americans created the market for the Japanese with both anime and video games. Gotcha. No, yeah, because the market was already there, but they're craving something. And yeah, that also makes sense about the high-end products. I do have some business acquaintances who are in the high-end luxury green tea market, Mm. which they export to the U.S. Other ones I've seen is people selling old kimonos. Mm. And they're exporting old kimonos and people are reusing them for creating modern fashion. Just taking bits and pieces of old kimonos and like creating different types of unique jeans, which is kind of pretty interesting. That makes me really happy to hear. I mean, kimonos and and Japanese crafts at large are kind of approaching a critical point because even though the craftspeople are are still active and they're they're making these wonderful and phenomenally high quality products, the domestic market and support for the makers seems to be fading such that I think that the total number of craftspeople in this country has fallen something like to a tenth of what it used to be a couple decades ago. A friend of mine Steve Bimel founded this organization called Japan Craft 21 to try to save them. He's doing his best, but my impression of this is that without foreign demand and without really people who can put a pipeline between foreign demand and the producers, it's going to be tough for them to survive. So I'm really, really happy to hear stories of people taking kimonos and innovating them into new products so that they can penetrate new markets. That's wonderful. And I'll ask you for the link to his website so we can promote it. And maybe some of the entrepreneurs listening to this, they can get some ideas for, you know, taking these high quality Japanese goods and exporting it to uh, high end consumers. Who want Wow, that, that'd that be great. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I did not think I'd be talking about Japan Craft 21 on an entrepreneurial podcast. But when you brought it up, the connection just seems so natural. Thank you. And I was trying to think of some other ones. Yeah, I also, I think, seeing nowadays, too, uh, I have a couple of friends who do social media and marketing for uh, sake, Japanese whiskey shops, and helping them gain more attention with a more international audience. Yeah, branding sake abroad, that seems to have gotten some recent big successes. I, I think a couple of days ago, Taro Kono, a major Japanese politician, he made his own social media post about a uh, foreign brand of sake. I, I don't remember exactly which one, but I, I did see on LinkedIn the creator, you know, very proudly touting the post. These sorts of things are often termed cultural exports, and they are kind of cultural exports, but it goes both ways, and it always goes both ways. I guess the, the golden example is Disney and anime. Anime became popular in the States around the turn of the millennium, and it was compared to Disney. But the style of anime of drawing uh, cartoon characters with large eyes and cute faces that derived from a, a very famous artist called Tezuka Osamu, who himself was inspired by Disney films. So you followed it around and it, it's always going in circles. People who can make the connection between the two markets are just integral to the process. Yeah, that could be a really good opportunity or something that maybe came to U.S., was refined, but you can take it back to the U.S. or vice versa. It's funny, like, you know, all of these stories where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess that could happen. 
but then when when someone goes ahead and does it, it's almost even better than you expect. Japan just has a way of uh, refining things. So I guess for me, that's kind of a surprise to me. But were there any things from Japan that you thought would succeed, but maybe failed? In general, anime Japanese contents, I think, missed a huge opportunity in the past 10 years in that the, the domestic industry here, you know, who own the rights to all of those properties, you know, under ideal circumstances, they could have gotten together, built a consortium and then figured out how to make their own platform to distribute it abroad. And, you know, for better or worse, that didn't happen. And now you have all of these foreign media companies, or well, mostly foreign media companies, that are controlling international distribution of Japanese things. That really was, personally, a, a bit of a disappointment, because it means that domestic creators here will get less support from the domestic industry. Yeah, and think people who are fans of anime, they could just have one channel, kind of like the anime network. Right. Yeah, I mean, they already have the content made for Japan, so it's it's not like this going to add too much, too much added costs. It's an interesting question because you have these, uh, you know, unexpected successes like Pokemon Go, which, you know, made Nintendo's, you know, share price, you know, spike from an AR game, which, you know, really hadn't been popular up until that point and yet had existed previously because all that really happened, and this is oversimplifying things, is that they slapped the Pokemon branding on top of Niantic's existing game. I forget what that one was called. But like the, the AR kind of like, you know, area taking game had already existed. They slapped on Pokemon and it blew up. It's hard to point at something and say that it should have succeeded and then lament that it didn't. But I guess to answer your question overall, I would say that there's been a lot of failures in execution. The failure to build the Japan branded anime distribution platform is a big one. The Cool Japan Fund, frankly, is another big one. I'm part of Cool Japan myself, but I think it's important to, you know, call things as they are. The idea of spending a lot of money, half a billion dollars, to invest in Japanese soft power, I think was a wonderful one. And, you know, they had some successes, but they have just some failures, which I think are impossible to explain other than really an embarrassing lack of due diligence. One of the fund's investments was in a series of restaurants that were supposed to be founded in, in Dubai. This was taking Japanese brands and moving them into Dubai. And the investment was made, the investment was announced, and then nothing happened after that. No ground was broken. The, the restaurants certainly don't exist now. There was never any follow-up. So it, it seems like there was really some sort of major failure there in execution. And it, it seems to happen a lot when you're talking about taking Japanese products abroad. The, the failure isn't quality. The failure isn't even necessarily product market fit. The failure is, is in execution. The failure is in having the wrong bridge builder. Often the failure is simply not involving someone who has a communications background. Like It's surprising what trips people up. And yet major Japanese companies will try to export their product abroad, get frustrated, and then never try again. Ah, uh, gotcha. To be frank, there's not too many people who actually have experience doing the market entry of taking Japanese things and taking it to overseas markets. There's a wealth of people who can do market entry to Japan, but I'm not sure if there's the equal amount of people who can do it outside. If you're talking about like the Japanese entrepreneurial community, like the recently formed one, you know, it's new. You know, it's only natural that you wouldn't see too many successes of them going global just because it's it's hard enough to be a successful entrepreneur in, in the domestic market. But historically, if you're looking at Japanese brands taking their products abroad, Honda's a, a great example. I mean, you know, everyone knows Honda in the States right now, but that wasn't always the case. Their big hit uh, in the United States was a, a little motorcycle called the Super Cup. The story of, of the success is actually, it involves a number of surprises. Initially, Honda tried to compete with big brands like Harley Davidson. So they tried to tell American motorcycle enthusiasts that their motorcycles were durable. They were just as powerful as American ones. They could ride long distances. And they didn't see really almost any success from doing that because the fact of the matter is, is that they had underestimated just how long and not so well maintained American roads were. Uh, their motorcycles broke down. Honda motor motorcycles initially broke down. 
And while they were trying to figure out what they could do about that, some of their friends, which they had made in local markets, just kind of passerbys, at least the story goes, noticed that when Honda employees were going from facility to facility, they were doing it on these cute little motorbikes that no American had ever seen. Honda was using their own product internally, and that's what got Americans' attention because no one had ever seen motorcycles being used for daily practical use. So the trick turned out not to be competing with Harley amongst motorcycle enthusiasts. The trick wound up being to tap this entirely new market of normal people, of people who never really considered themselves motorcyclists, but like getting around easily just like everyone else. It wound up being... I think one of the most successful marketing campaigns in business history, uh, the tagline was, you meet the nicest people on a Honda. And, you know, it's a cute story. But the point is, is that approaching market entry, you know, from Japan abroad can involve just a, a heck of a lot of surprises and really even just a necessary amount of trial and error. It is very, very difficult to market a product abroad the same way that it's marketed domestically in Japan. Too many things are different. The Japanese market is just too unique. It comes back to that product market country fit. Let's say you're having a product that works in one country, it has to be adopted to another country. But in this case, it was actually the opposite. The product that you had actually was a fit, but uh, you didn't know about it. But you tried to adjust too much to that market. So that's kind of interesting. I think it really highlights that point you made about things happen and things just work and you, you get lucky in some cases. I wanted to give another big shout out to our sponsor, Hashi Media. Looking to expand your marketing and reach for your gaming, tech, or lifestyle brand? Hashi Media can help you make that transition. They have helped major brands and why not let them help you with yours? I know the founders personally, and they know their stuff to give your marketing the push it needs to reach a larger audience. They're also hiring social media account managers, copywriters, and graphic designers. Be sure to check them out at hashimedia.com. Really all of the big kind of like cool Japanish hits where a Japanese product just absolutely takes off in America and in the West at large, tend to have more to do with foreign demand for high quality stuff, like a dearth in that particular area, than they have to do with any sort of like Japan-led outward messaging effort. It almost feels silly to say this because, you know, we're, again, we're talking in the English language towards a largely international audience. But the trick with going Japan abroad is to make sure that you know the target market well, that you understand that it's very different from the Japanese market. And that you make sure that you're able to interface with your potential customers in a way so that communication is clear. And again, this is obvious stuff, but it's just so easy to get it wrong because there are so many business experts in this country who go to another country and assume that everything that they think is common sense is also common sense there. It rarely is. So I think we have some people in the market entry field, like market entry to Japan, could be foreign, could be Japanese listening to the podcast, but would you have any tips for them trying to help a company go the other way? To go out of Japan? Ah, uh, yes. This sounds a bit odd to say, but you kind of have to be able to turn Japanese common sense on its head. Thinking about how to succeed in market entry here, and then thinking about the inverse of that in some limited cases can be helpful. So in Japan, what makes the Japanese market special is that relationships are everything. Like you can have the best idea, you can have the best product, but if you move fast and break things, you'll wind up like Uber and Airbnb. You have great products and, you know, got into trouble really quickly. It doesn't really work that way in the United States. In the United States, if you have a really, really good product and you're able to execute on it really, really, really fast, just like those two companies that I just mentioned, you can reach great success before the government decides to step in and, you know, try to tell you what's what, so to speak. Explaining that to Japanese companies can be quite tricky because when they initially go abroad, they're very interested in feeling out the ecosystem to trying to make sure that they're not making waves to, you know, kind of like taking ginger steps to make sure that they don't fail. But failing fast 
particularly from the perspective of someone who's used to the Japanese market, is probably generally a good way to go in the beginning, not because it's good to fail, but because it can provide a fresh reminder of just how different the foreign markets can be. I can actually share an example. So I did help my friend a little bit try to export that、uh, electronic kendama to the US. And the challenge、mm. we found was the players in the US were the hardcore kendama players. They were so good that the technology to keep up with how fast they move, like let's say you couldn't get that in the first version or second version. It was like they're like insane levels. It's like ridiculous. Let's say 1080 flips catching the ball. To get the technology to be good enough for them, it would take many, many years. But in the Japanese market, Sometimes it's a little bit too small.、Hmm. And even though so they had kind of an interesting challenge there. Well, I think that it's really good that those meetings happened. Like going abroad and talking to potential consumers is an important step. And it's one that occasionally gets missed. I think it's often because of, of fear of failure or fear of you know, potentially bothering people. So, that you know, would be Japanese entrepreneurs abroad will overly rely on domestic resources. So, that they'll go to the Japanese experts and say, How do you think we should approach external markets? That can work, but I guess there's a part of that wishes that more people would just try to do grassroots outreach themselves just to see what happens. So, there's lots of people abroad who love Japan, and there's lots of people abroad. Particularly in the United States, who will want to buy something or will be interested in buying something simply because it's Japanese. And these people congregate at Japan focused events. There are Japan America societies all over the United States. There are cherry blossom festivals all over the United States. I didn't actually know this until recently,、um, <laughs> but Nashville, Tennessee has an annual cherry blossom festival, and so does Houston, Texas. Their cherry blossoms bloom in January. Normally it's March, April in Japan, but it's actually January in Houston. And of course, this is in addition to you know, the famous ones in Washington, D.C. It might be impossible to find out exactly where in, say, and, you know, the U.S. is an easy example, but where, where in the United States you would find potential buyers for your product. But it is relatively easy to find the pockets of Americans who would simply be interested in talking to you because you come from Japan. It's just kind of look up the date of the event, take a flight over there, and talk to people. That itself, I think, is very valuable. Yeah, I think that is a very good point. I mean, initially it was created for the Japanese market and they wanted to expand overseas, but spending more time to have those conversations before kind of putting a lot of effort into it would have, let's say, made the launch a bit more successful. This is another Stefan story, but.、Um... At one point during the pandemic, Stefan was supposed to host a panel on this entrepreneurial summit down in Fukuoka and asked me to sub in for him. So, you know, lucky me, I got to go down and meet the entrepreneurs down in Fukuoka who are wonderful. And one of them, Mr. Hashimoto, oh, I'm worried that I'll get his, his company name wrong. I believe it was Neuron. He was on the panel and he said something wonderful, which I'll always remember. He recommends people going and just trying to talk to people abroad. And even though, you know, as part of the event, we had Fukuoka City Hall there with, you know, the great resources that they have for helping foreign entrepreneurs in Fukuoka and Fukuoka and lo- local entrepreneurs go abroad. He had this guy on stage basically saying, like, you know, as soon as you can, just try to talk to people abroad directly. It might go easier than you think. Not that this stuff happens necessarily intentionally, but you know, in, in any complicated process, consultants along the way can occasionally inadvertently be, become gatekeepers. I don't think that anyone does it on purpose, but if you're familiar with the foreign market, say, of like 20, 30 years ago, and then you make a career of yourself as a consultant in Japan for that many decades, the advice that you give isn't necessarily going to help someone who wants to go over now. So, going over now can be quite helpful, even though initially it's quite intimidating.、Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Just so you can get the most recent information. People have asked me advice about doing the opposite, like doing US market entry. And I was like, actually, because I'm American, I assumed that I could just do it. But I think that 
is that you really need to do market research. Even if you're American or even if it's to your home country, just go out and talk to people before you actually give it a try. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I've been here 15 years now and my knowledge of how America has changed in those 15 years is limited to the Americans I still know who I talk to, you know, who are there. A lot changes very, very quickly. I am not as young as I like to think I am. I did see you doing some flips now and then. <laughs> Thank you. You got to keep on doing them. Otherwise, you stop being able to do them. You know, that's the trick, right? Keep on doing it into your old age. So I guess, do you have any tips for working with or connecting with JICA or Jetro? And could you, if possible, could you explain what they are? JICA, for, for the most part, is for developing countries who want to be sites for aid projects from the Japanese government. They're kind of like Japan's equivalent of the Peace Corps, kind of. And then JETRO, the, the Japan External uh, oh God, I'm gonna get the Trade wrong. Resource Trade Organization, maybe? Research Organization. A research, um, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, they can be useful in targeted circumstances. I mean, again, it depends on where you are when you're listening to this podcast. If you're in, you know, Vietnam, the other Southeast Asian developing countries, uh, and you have an entrepreneurial project, you, you may very well be able to work with JICA. I'm, I'm not actually sure myself. It's not really my specialty. JETRO tends to help organizations here, including entrepreneurial ones, find potential partners abroad, but they don't do that so much by matching in as much as helping with the event planning and exposure. They run these things called the J Startup uh, Global Acceleration Hubs. They're worth looking into as channels and platforms to kind of go out, get your name out there and meet people. But I think it's important to approach them, not specifically as market entry, but as exposure and events. The reason that I say that is because Jetro and, and I, you know, JICA as well are very much Japanese bureaucratic organizations with their own domestic and internal constraints that may or may not line up with any given individual entrepreneur's interests. It's not to say don't use them. In fact, I think that you should. But in addition to that, I also think that it's important to go to conventions, go to summits and shake hands with people there on your own. Trying to go into something with specifically with the Jetro brand and find a success based only on, say, riding their coattails, I don't think is a, is a particularly successful avenue. But it tends to be almost like the second instinct of a lot of folks in the business community here who are used to the Japanese proverb of Okinabo ni makarero, or, you know, joining something big and steady in order to ensure against failure trick to succeeding abroad, I think, is to actually expose yourself to limited small failures so that you can get a sense of how different things are. And if you only try to do that within purely Japanese channels, I just don't think it won't be enough of a learning experience. I think that was excellent advice. I kind of got the impression, too, of exactly what you said. It's uh, They're very good for getting exposure, getting you to these big events. In some cases, they'll pay for your airfare depending on the program, maybe to go to this conference, or they might have some Japan booth at some trade show in a foreign country, and they may show your products, take you there. They can give you the exposure, but you're the one who are going to have to close the deals. They're not going to hand you things in your lap. And I think yeah, you mentioned the startup one too. And there, there's actually, I know a foreign guy. I think his company is called Susu Robo, mm -hmm. but I think it's like an AI chat or something like that. Or in this case, it's not Jetro, but he's going through, um, actually, I think a startup accelerator, a Japanese one. Hmm. So sorry, it's not Jetro in this case, but it's a Japanese accelerator plug and play. And they're taking them to, I think, the US to show off. For startups, there are, like, what's the accelerators? Uh, Jetro has an accelerator itself. So that's why I think I made the connection. And Jetro does uh, take some Japanese companies and even Japanese companies with foreign founders to the US, to other countries, to display them and to get them, like you said, more exposure. Mm. I think Jetro is pretty good. I think for domestically, I mean, they have a, some pretty good translation of English contracts. If you need an employment contract, I think if you just type in, like maybe it's Jetro Jaika or English contract in Japan or something like that, 
they have a really good uh, contract that has just basic legality that all contracts mm. need. Also, you mentioned like there's some other organizations in the U.S. I think it's a little bit before the Hanami part. But what are some organizations in the U.S. or kind of communities that people are trying to sell overseas can tap into? The local Japan America Society can be a good place to look for upcoming events and gatherings of people who are into Japan. The Cherry Blossom Festivals, I actually also think are, are good, significant markers. The communities around consulates general can also be a good indications of where you might be able to make good connections. The one in Nashville is probably the reason why they have the Cherry Blossom Festival there. I guess kind of my rule of thumb is to look for independent interest that isn't necessarily connected to institutions in Japan. Like try to find the people who love Japan so much that they organize something on their own. Anime conventions are, are another good example of this, although their use might be more for people who are trying to sell media products or something related to media. But generally speaking, if you want to find where the Japan brand works, find the people who love Japan so much that they spend their precious free time organizing events about Japan without any support from the Japanese government. Cool. And also, I think you mentioned some major events, like expos. What are some major expos for, like, let's say, people who really like Japan? So if you're talking about independently organized gatherings, huge events uh, in the United States amongst people who just really love the Japanese brand, things like Anime Expo are definitely what initially uh, comes to mind. Anime Expo, I think, is, is the biggest one, or maybe it was recently the biggest one, with over 100,000 people attending. They held one a few months ago in July, but the attendance figure that I have is from 2019. I mean, I, I think they'll get back up there. But there's other independently organized ones uh, all over the United States. I remember when I was in college, I went to Anime Boston's inaugural event. I think that was in 2003. You'll find them in most U.S. states. If you just Google a state and then anime convention, it comes right up. And these are not necessarily people who are going to be your business partner. They certainly aren't necessarily going to be interested in anything specific about Japan that doesn't relate to anime. But they will love Japan and they will give you a good sense of how Japan is perceived by foreign fans. If you're interested in how the Japanese brand kind of shifts abroad, you know, spending a day, half a day at an American anime convention, I think will be a great learning experience. Awesome. And I know Amazon is one platform you could sell your product overseas, but what are some other platforms that someone could sell their products or service to a foreign market? From looking around now, it looks like Shopify, Ship and Co are two big players. Personally, I've always liked following what Max Hodges does with his White Rabbit and Black Ship brands. Max Hodges has been in the game almost 20 years, if not more. I went to his warehouse and it is amazing the, the quantities of Japanese stuff he's shipping abroad to people who are ordering it from all over the world. So Max fundamentally runs a service where you can buy something from Japan ship it to his company, and then they ship it to you because not all Japanese creators are used to the intricacies of shipping things globally. If I were trying to figure out global shipping, my goodness, I would want to try to get time with that man. Because Max Hodges just has some amazing experiences. I definitely know the White Rabbit label. If you have a particularly complex project or you want to do something that specifically focuses on strategic communication, my own kind of folks there, Parthenon Japan, a strategic communication firm in Omote Sando, I think we're good people. We can definitely help out with that. But also just trying to contact American potential partners, like through those Japan societies, which I said beforehand, organically, you might be able to come up with your own routes depending on what you're specifically trying to do. But Shopify and Shippico look pretty good right now. Cool. And do you have any other tips for foreign entrepreneurs or Jap even Japanese entrepreneurs in Japan listening to this episode who are thinking about selling Japanese products or taking from something from Japan overseas? 
You know, before I answer this question, I, I should also mention Kinokuniya, the bookstore brand in Japan, has more locations abroad than you might think, and many of them focus less on books and more on stationary goods. So looking specifically into existing distribution channels with just kind of an eye for things that are surprises, I think is time well spent. Being open to surprises and particularly being open to a completely different marketing and distribution strategy than you're used to domestically, I think is the real you know, headline for market entry outside of Japan. If there's one thing I guess I would want to leave everyone with, to go back to my friend Steve Bimel and his organization, Japancraft 21, Steve's been bringing American art aficionados and other VIPs into the Japanese crafts world for about half a century. And whenever I hear stories from him, you know, a real veteran, I'm always surprised at this big juxtaposition or a contrast. There's all this high quality, you know, crafts, pottery, kimono, weaving, lacquerware, what have you. And when you bring these art aficionados, you know, people on the boards of museums into workshops, they go crazy because they've never seen anything that good before. Like never. I mean, there's really something special about Japanese quality. But the point is, is that someone has to bring them in and that the craftspeople will not and unfortunately cannot do it themselves. There needs to be a partner. So expanding overseas isn't just something that's you know good for you as an entrepreneur. I think it's really good for Japan at large because historically, anything from Japan that's been a hit abroad almost always got pulled there by foreign aficionados of Japan. Japan does not have a good track record in pushing its own stuff abroad. It needs to be pulled. But now that there's a, a vibrant, you know, micro entrepreneurial community booming in Japan, I think that things really might take a shift and really a critical shift in that people who are here, who have a little bit more of an international eye and can be a little bit flexible to see Japan, not just from the Japanese perspective, but also the foreign perspective, might be able to get a new dynamic going where they can see the Japanese stuff that's special see people abroad who are clamoring for something new and maybe make the connection on their own. Steve is trying as hard as he can with traditional crafts. If you are interested in Japan Craft 21 and interested in helping Steve, it's a worthy cause. He's the best guy to lead the effort. And the photos that he takes are amazing. But even if you're not interested in crafts, taking anything in Japan, finding the people abroad who would be interested in it and making that connection, even if it's part of a purely private entrepreneurial effort, I think really helps the country. And it's really, really time for more people to get into that right now. That is an excellent note. And I wanted to give people some tips to actually help make that a reality. One thing I've seen with friends who are working with uh, Japanese craftsmen or artisanal people is you know, that first year is really hard. You're going to get a lot of no's. People are going to be suspicious. But, you know, if you just keep pushing through it after a year, you know, the connections start. And like, really, once you get a couple connections, the ball starts moving a lot faster. So if you do try to enter this type of market, you could go to like an expert, someone who's really connected. Like, uh, what is his name again? Steve Bynell. Oh, uh, Steve Bynell. Or if you do it yourself, don't give up quickly. It takes time. You might be the first foreigner to propose to that person, you know, so don't expect things to happen immediately. It takes time to really dive into each, let's say, vertical or each niche or each type of market. So if you go into green tea, it takes a while to break into that, to build those connections. If you go into the sake world, it takes time to get into the sake world. If you go into the Japanese snacks, it takes time. Don't expect one week or even one month. It might take you six months. It might take you one year. But if you continuously put yourself out there, people will start to trust you more. That's absolutely right. It takes time, but it's worth it. But once you get that trust and that connection, it's a hard relationship to, let's say, it, it can last a lifetime. Every Japanese business relationship is a marriage. We can leave it on that note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But it was great to have you on the podcast, Benjamin. And do you have any asks for the audience? Oh, thanks so much for having me, Tyson. If you like what I had to say, I put out content on LinkedIn. You can look up me up at uh, benjaminboaz.com. Please check out my new book, uh, From Cool Japan to Your Japan, or Nihon wa Kuru, Machigai Darake no Nihon no Bunka Hashin, uh, available on Amazon, currently a bestseller. Get it before it sells out. Have you ever found yourself having trouble creating a business plan? Do you pretty much operate on a day to day or week to week basis, creating confusion and chaos in your organization? If that sounds like you, I recommend you join my entrepreneur bootcamp. In my bootcamp, you will set an achievable but challenging revenue target for the current or following fiscal year, and we will create a business plan to make it a reality. See more in the show notes below. And now back to our episode. And we'll definitely link to from Cool Japan to Your Japan, and we'll throw in the link on Amazon. Thanks so much, Benjamin, and look forward to talking to you again. I had a great time, Tyson. Thank you.